Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus in this region of Tyre and Sidon. It's outside of where Jesus is. These are the people on the outside. She comes and says, and we know from the story, her daughter is severely possessed with the demon. She implores Jesus, cries out to him, and Jesus doesn't answer, and she stays with it. She doesn't give up. She stays with it, and Jesus says he's only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's where he's going. And the woman doesn't give up. She's not discouraged. She keeps at it. She's not letting him go. And he answers with apparent hardness, Jesus does. It's not right to take children's bread and give it to the dogs. She does not get discouraged. She does not turn away. She stays with him. She says, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. She changes the dogs. The little dogs. The puppies. I'm not going away. The disciples want her sent away. The Lord seems to push her. And she is not turning away. And he says, great is your faith. Great is your faith. Be it done to you. Whatever you want. What is it you want? Your daughter? Fine. And it says at that moment, immediately, healed. Essentially, it works like this. He says, I'm a shepherd who's been sent to other sheep. And she says, well, I'm a sheep that won't let you go. Like, I'm going to chase the shepherd down. That's how this really, this is kind of the story. And there's there's multiple layers. And, and to even get into some of this, we'll save it for next year. We'll save some of this for next year. It's coming back around again. But it's important to know something. Just prior to this gospel reading, this one we've just had and I've just summarized or retold, the scribes and the Pharisees are into it with Jesus about purity. They're into it with him, and they're arguing and discussing and quarreling, but they're not humble, and they're not patient, and they're not even believing. They're just into it with him. They're just into it with him, full of unbelief and quarreling and arrogance. And then we have the story of the Canaanite woman, who's like the opposite of those vices and full of virtue, with belief and patience and humility. And St. John Chrysostom and other church fathers stress these three virtues, faith, patience, and humility, with this woman from Cana, this Canaanite woman. And we see her faith, right? You've seen it. He actually says, great is your faith. Just to see the interaction and how she won't let up, she's crying out, knowing that even though her daughter is severely possessed, which is a real thing, has a real thing and that is a real problem and this is beyond like whatever might normally be done some prayers some maybe some counseling and whatever this is beyond those things and she has faith she's like Jesus can do this I'm not gonna go away till he gives me what I want and we see her patience she won't even after a rebuke she won't let up she's patient she's even patient with the Lord She really believes, and she really is patient. And we need to have our prayers be like her prayers. If they seem to go unanswered, that we would not only pray with our lips, but with our mind and our heart, with some patience, and persevere and not give up. And Jesus will himself tell parables on the virtue of keeping at it. And then we've got this virtue of humility, which is strongly emphasized and pretty dramatic about the, the, the bread won't be given to dogs. And she says, well, I'll take crumbs then. You won't give bread, I'll have crumbs. Like she doesn't, she doesn't go, who are you calling a dog? You know, how dare you, I have rights. My lawyer will be, you know, sending the apostles a letter tomorrow morning or something. She's like, no bread, I'll take crumbs. If he just said crumbs, she just said molecules. You know, molecules, he, he, she'd have gone atoms. Or, I'm, I don't know, my science is off. But <laughs> she'd have gone down, 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 down. She's humble. She, she's going to keep going. I won't take bread. She'll go, well, I don't want bread then. I want you to heal my daughter. You know, she would have gone down humble. She would not have said, that's too far. She did not get offended. She got more humble. She got more patient. She was full of more faith. The epistle reading we have today is in this same atmosphere. 
these two are not dramatically connected, but it's like the state, they evolve in the same like hemisphere or something. They're in the same type of place. And it starts out, and everyone needs to hear this, and especially maybe our kids. It starts out by saying, you are the temple of God. I mean, I don't want us to hear that and go, all right, temple of God, check. I mean, I think that should sort of stop us. I'm the what? I'm the what? You are the temple of God. God says, I will live in them, move among them. I'll be their God. There'll be my people. Therefore, and he says, come out, be separate from them, touch nothing clean. There's a call to purity. Touch nothing clean. Um... Cleanse yourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Make holiness perfect in the fear of God. So there's this, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and keep the temple tidy. Keep, keep the temple clean. Keep it swept. Don't let anything in that shouldn't be in the temple. Don't have anything in your heart that should not be there. Don't let your heart get cold. Don't let your heart get hard. The temple needs to be warm. And clean. And Paul emphasizes these facts. The heart needs to be swept and clean. And the heart signifies more than just our emotions. We're used to just, and on Valentine's Day, it's like basically all emotion, you know? So hopefully love will survive the day into the 15th. <laughs> I think it will. But, but if we're not careful, we'll just think, you know, the heart signifies like where love comes from and love, and that's an emotion, and that's kind of the end of it. But for the Orthodox, the heart really is the spiritual center of the person. It's like the palace where the Lord resides. The heart is everything. The heart is everything. St. Isaac the Syrian, who we call Abba Isaac, who wrote maybe the greatest book ever written. We'll get into that some other day, but... Abba Isaac, who reposed around 700, year 700, said this, Be at peace with your own soul, and then heaven and earth will be at peace with you. Enter eagerly into the treasure house that is within you. The treasure house that's within you. And so you will see things that are in heaven. There's one single entry to them both. The ladder that leads to the kingdom is hidden within your soul. Free from sin, dive into yourself to see your soul. You'll discover the stairs on which to ascend. The treasure house within you. And then there are, as you may have, poems or songs, prose, whatever, that sticks with you. You hear it once and you go, I'll never forget this speech, or I'll never forget this saying, or I want to hear that song again. I never want to forget that line or that turn of phrase. Abba Macarius said something like that for me, and you may have heard this before. And I know I've said it before. Within the heart, there are unfathomable depths. There's reception rooms and offices in it, porches and passages. In it is the workshop of righteousness and the workshop of wickedness. In it is depth and life, unfathomable depths, says Macarius. The heart is Christ's palace, he goes on to say where Christ the King comes to take his rest with the angels and the spirits and the saints. And he dwells there, walking within it and placing his kingdom there. The heart is but a small vessel, he goes on to say, and yet dragons and lions are there and poisonous creatures and the treasures of wickedness. Rough and uneven paths are there and gaping chasms. There likewise is God, there are the angels, there is life and the kingdom, the light of the apostles, the heavenly cities, the treasures of grace, all things are there. The heart is that inner being of the inner person. So when Christ says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, quoting the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, he means with everything. He'll add mind, soul, strength. He'll just make sure we don't miss it. But the heart for us, it's everything. And that's the great adventure, to enter into the heart in prayer, 
and find the good shepherd in the fields there who's waiting for us, and maybe with a little rebuke. I don't know <laughs> what he will say when you find him, but he's there waiting. And don't give up. St. Seraphim and Sarah, next to our patron here, this great ascetic and Russian saint of, really, of our time, just uh, 1833, I think, his repose. He said, find inner peace, and thousands around you will find their salvation. If we're not careful, we'll think inner peace is like having not to go to work that day or something. You know, inner peace will be just leave me alone for five more minutes. And he's not speaking of that kind of being left alone. He's speaking of something of the heart, something of being with Christ. Find inner peace. Thousands will find their salvation around you. And the order is really important. You have to find this. And then, and then they'll take care of it. That's their business, the next thing. Or we'll, we'll tend to them next. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything flows from it. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart. And there's something about that from the epistle, right? About keeping the, the, the palace kind of clean. Come out from them, be separate from them. Don't, don't have defilement of soul and body. Whatever should not be in the heart should not be in the heart. And we're approaching that time in the liturgy where we really ask the Holy Spirit to come down on us and the gifts here present and to change them. Both us and the gifts. To change them. Us and the gifts. The call of the gospel is to extend this time, this time we're in, this peace we're in, and in a way the heart that we're in, the kingdom that we're in, to extend it. To extend it into every aspect of our lives, to extend it throughout the week to come, push it all the way into Monday, then into Tuesday, to push the kingdom everywhere. To push this time of the liturgy where we draw near and the Holy Spirit comes down on us. At the end of the service, as you guys are coming up for dismissal and, and venerating the cross and saying hi as we go out and and, uh, and have coffee hour. The choir and whoever goes back is praying post-communion prayers. And they're beautiful. Sometimes we're more quiet than others. It's okay. It's probably good to try to be a little quieter and hear some of this. But I don't know that we hear this, and I want to read the beginning of one of the prayers that are prayed. It's by St. Simeon. It's the fourth prayer of Thanksgiving after communion. O thou who dost willingly give thy flesh to me as food, Thou art a fire, consuming the unworthy, consume me not, O my creator, but rather pass through all my body parts, into my joints, my reins, my heart. Burn thou the thorns of all my transgression, cleanse my soul, hallow my thoughts, make firm my knees and bones likewise, enter into one Enter, enlighten as one my five senses and establish me wholly in thy fear. And it goes on, including the line, show me to be a tabernacle of thy spirit only. Shmemen will argue, and we're going to end with this. Father Alexander Shmemen argued that that's, that line, you are what you eat, is true. He goes, that's true. And we're entering into that time where we're going to ask the Lord to enter into all of us, body parts, joints, reins, heart, knees. I don't know if anybody's got any bad knees. Knees, everything, and make my bones firm and show me to be a tabernacle of the Spirit that my heart might be, that if I could guard it, my heart might be a palace for Christ the King to sit. The inquirers and catechumens are going to get a lot more about this in the class, about Schmemann's quote, about you are what you eat and what mankind was created to be by God. But when I read this about this woman coming wanting bread and knowing that she's speaking to the bread of life 
And what she really gets is healing. I think this is our story. We want to not miss the Canaanite woman's story because that's our story. We come to him asking for something. It winds up being a discussion about bread. And then we have healing. And we're in that exact moment. We come to the Lord asking something of him. I don't know what you're asking. And now we're in a discussion about bread. And what he wants to give us is himself for the healing of our souls and bodies. In the name of the Father and the Son.